The world has seen many powerful terrorists in the last few decades, with Abu Nadal being one of the strongest of them all. The terror kingpin led a terrorist group that was widely regarded as the most dangerous terrorist group in the world in the 1980s for its brutal attacks on Western, Palestinian, and Israeli targets. Watch the video till the end as we tell you everything there is to know about Abu Nidal, the notorious terror kingpin. Early Life Sabri Khalil Albana, a.k.a. Abu Nidal, was born in 1937 in Jaffa, which was located on the Mediterranean coast of the British-occupied Palestine. Abu Nidal belonged to a wealthy family, as his father, Khalil Albana, held 6,000 acres of orange plantations between Jaffa and Majdal. He was the wealthiest person in Palestine as 10% of all the citrus crops sent from Palestine to Europe, particularly to England and Germany, were marketed by him. Abu Nadal's father sent him to a French mission school by the name of Collège des Frères de Jaffa in 1944. One year later, Sabri's father passed away and his stepfamily kicked his mother out. Consequently, his brothers took him out of the mission school and put him in Umaria Elementary Institution a prominent private Muslim school in Jerusalem, where he spent the next two years of his life. Division of Palestine Then in 1947, the United Nations decided to divide Palestine into an Arab and Jewish state on November 29, 1947. This was not taken well by the Palestinians, and soon the fighting started. The family's income was negatively impacted by the disruption of the citrus fruit business as food shortages and truck bombings all became the norm. As a result, the family retreated to their home near Majdal just before Israeli troops captured Jaffa in April 1948. Soon the Israeli troops also arrived there, and the family was forced to leave once again. Then they went to the Barij refugee camp in the Gaza Strip, which was at the time governed by Egypt. The family was forced to live in tents for nine months while relying on UNRWA for a ration of potatoes, grains, and oil. Palestine's Secret Organization these experiences had a significant impact on Abu Nadal. After things got relatively better, he traveled to Saudi Arabia in 1960, where he established himself as a painter and electrician and started working for Aramco. At that time, Abu Nadal annually visited his mother in Nablus. On one of those occasions in 1962, he first met his wife, whose family had also fled Jaffa. The two of them got married and had two daughters and a son. In his later years, Abu Nadal tended to dress in worn-out pants and zip-up jackets, while also drinking whiskey every night. He was also frequently in poor health. He developed into a master of disguises and deception, distrusting everyone, isolated and self-protective, and living like a mole out of sight. This was the time when he assisted in developing a small group of young Palestinians who referred to themselves as the Palestine Secret Organization. After the Saudi authorities found his involvement, he lost both his job and his house, along with Aramco kicking him out. Moreover, the Saudi authorities jailed and banished him from the country. Then he moved back to Nablus with his wife and children, and began working odd jobs. He was committed to Palestinian politics, but was not very active. Join Fatah Organization This changed when Abu Nadal joined Yasser Arafat's Fatah Organization in Amman and deepened his involvement in the Palestinian cause. He established Impex, a trading company, which evolved into a front for Fatah as members met there and funds were laundered through the company's bank accounts. During this time of paramilitary agitation, Nadal never established a reputation as a guerrilla, hiding himself in his office. However, he had a strong reputation inside Fatah for his organizational skills and was chosen to serve as the organization's envoy in Sudan in 1968 and Iraq two years later. The radicalization of Palestinian politics in general, and Nadal in particular, increased when Jordan's King Hussein rid his nation of the disruptive Palestinian rebels. Nadal rose to prominence inside Fatah as the head of a leftist coalition against Arafat, teaming up with Abu Dawood, a violent commander who would plan the 1972 Munich Olympic bombings. At Fatah's third congress in Damascus in December 1971, Nadal requested that Arafat be removed as the enemy of the Palestinian people and also called for harsh retaliation against King Hussein. Subsequently, in 1973, Abu Daoud was detained in Jordan after attempting to kill King Hussein. Abu Daoud's Arrest After Abu Daoud's arrest, things got really bad. This resulted in Abu Nidal's first operation, named as Al-Iqab, which is Arabic for the punishment. In view of this, 
Five assailants stormed the Saudi embassy in Paris on September 5, 1973, kidnapping 15 hostages and issuing a bomb threat if Abu Daoud was not freed. The gunmen took the hostages along with them on the plane flight from Riyadh to Kuwait on Syrian airways two days later and threatened to throw the hostages out of the plane. As a result, two weeks later, Abu Daoud was freed from jail and the Kuwaiti government had to pay $12 million to King Hussein. In October 1974, Abu Nidal founded the ANO under the name Fatah the Revolutionary Council. As many as 500 young men from Lebanon's and Palestine's refugee camps were selected for the group, with the promise of a fair wage and assistance in taking care of their families. Depending on which nation was hosting the ANO at the time, which was usually Syria, Iraq, or Libya, these men would be transported to training camps there and were not permitted to leave after entering. In view of his growing power, the Iraqis then granted Abu Nadal the assets of Fatah in Iraq, including a training facility, farm, newspaper, radio station, passports, abroad scholarships, and $15 million worth of Chinese weapons. Additionally, he received the PLO's monthly donation of about $150,000 and an upfront payment of three to $5 million from Iraq. The Untouchable the capacity of the Abu Nadal organization to appear and conduct attacks virtually any place increased by leaps and bounds. During the early 1980s, the organization was able to commit crimes in more than 20 nations, in addition to Belgium and England. This was evident as on July 25, 1980, the Israeli ambassador was killed in Brussels. Two days later, a synagogue in Antwerp was attacked with hand grenades, resulting in the death of a child and the injury of 20 others. Furthermore, Israeli ambassador to the United Kingdom, Shlomo Argov, was brutally shot by ANO assailant Hussein Ghassan Syed on June 3, 1982, as he was leaving London's Dorchester Hotel. Argov lived, but he was crippled for the remainder of his life and died in February 2003 after staying for three months in a coma. In response, three days later, the PLO's base of operations in Lebanon was invaded by Ariel Sharon, Israel's defense minister at the time. Abu Nadal's power kept on increasing until in 1983, when Saddam Hussein, the then president of Iraq, got rid of Abu Nadal in an effort to present himself as a regional strongman and defender of Western interests in the face of Ayatollah Khomeini's Iran. To thwart peace efforts with Israel, Damascus funded his outfit to kill Jordanian ambassadors. However, Nadal had already gone above and beyond, demonstrating a great awareness of triggering historically momentous occurrences of an Epicedian character. The 1985 assaults on the airports in Vienna and Rome are considered to be Abu Nadal's most notorious operation. On December 27th, four terrorists opened fire on the El Al ticket window at Rome's Leonardo da Vinci International Airport, leaving 16 people dead and 99 injured. A few minutes later, four people were killed and 39 were injured, when three men at Vienna International Airport tossed hand grenades at people waiting to board a flight to Tel Aviv. Moving to Libya In the summer of 1986, Abu Nadal was expelled from Syria as a result of the Hindawi scandal and the hijacking of Pan Am Flight 73. Abu Nadal started to move his group from Syria to Libya and eventually arrived there in March 1987. Throughout this time, he regularly claimed credit for actions in which he had no part such as the 1984 bombing of a hotel in Brighton, the 1985 fire at Bradford City Stadium, and the 1986 assassination of Zafar al-Masri. Throughout the 1980s, there were reports of numerous purges, which resulted in almost 600 ANO members being killed, including 171 in a single night in November 1987, when they were lined up, shot, and dumped into a mass grave. Moreover, numerous people were killed in the Badawi refugee camp after being kidnapped in Syria. As a result of these purges, Atif Abu Bakir, the leader of the ANO's political directorate, left the organization in 1989 and later joined Fatah. Success and Muammar Gaddafi The ruthless devotion that Abu Nadal himself expected and the repeated purges he carried out contributed to the ANO's massive success. Moreover, the hired recruits went through excruciating pain to remain loyal to their cause. For instance, the names and addresses of family members, friends, and other associates were included in the life tales that new recruits were expected to write out over the course of many days. Members would be asked to rewrite this material as a recurring loyalty test, which was then compared to the original. Disparities were interpreted as proof that the member was a spy and that the original had been a fabrication. Those caught were brutally tortured and then killed. Abu Nadal was also great friends with the ruler of Libya, Muammar Gaddafi. 
Both men apparently had the dangerous mix of an inferiority complex and the conviction that they were men of great destiny. The partnership offered Gaddafi a mercenary and Abu Nidal a sponsor. As a result, Abu Nidal's darkest traits were revealed, when even the most senior ANO members were forbidden from meeting alone, and all meetings had to be reported to him. It was necessary to turn in all passports. Nobody was permitted to travel without his consent. While ordinary members were forbidden from owning phones, and only senior members were permitted to make local calls. His family members were unaware of any aspect of his everyday life, even where he lived. The Assassination The night before U.S. forces entered Kuwait on January 14, 1991, the ANO assassinated Abu Iyad, the PLO's head of intelligence, along with Abu al-Hol, the head of security for Fatah in Tunis. Hamza Abu Zaid, the murderer, said that this was ANO's revenge against Abu Iyad. After agents of the Libyan intelligence service were accused of carrying out the Lockerbie bombing, Gaddafi made an effort to disassociate himself from terrorism. After having to leave Libya in 1999, Abu Nadal went back to Iraq. Later, the Iraqi administration claimed that he had entered the nation under a false name and with a phony Yemeni passport. Then on August 19, 2002, it was revealed by Iraqi authorities that Abu Nadal had died at his Baghdad house from numerous gunshot wounds. Well, that's it for today's video. We hope you enjoyed the content of the video. And if you did, show some love and hit that like button. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss out on any of the amazing videos we have in store for you.